You know, if there's one question I get asked more than any other, more even than if you're having fun wasting time, then is that actually time wasted? That question would have to be, Mark, is the Nikon 50mm f1.2 AIS manual focus lens an icon of burnished brass and glass or just an old dog that needs to be put out of its misery to make way for a new breed of optics that are technically perfect but perfectly boring? Well, today we're going to try and answer that question. Let's get straight into it. A Nikon 50mm lens, but not any 50mm lens. This one is a certified light bucket. With an f1.2 aperture, it's designed to suck light in like a black hole without leaving you in a black hole of despair with the results. That was the promise when it came out in 1978. But can it live up to all of that hype in the cold, dystopian reality of the 2020s? It was evening, I was in Shinjuku in Tokyo, and I was rocking my Nikon 50mm f1.2 AIS lens slapped on to my Nikon FE with generic 800T motion picture film. Time to get my street tog on.
Okay, all right. Okay. Instagram. Okay, give me your Instagram. Okay. Bro, <laughs> right. you, you're so cool. Ah, okay. You look so cool. cool. Where are you from? Uh, Australia, where are you from? Oh, She's I'm from Australia. Half, I'm half Australian. Oh, really? Hey, salut les mecs, je suis français, je viens de Paris. Euh, bon, bah voilà, je suis à Tokyo, je suis à Kabukicho. Show them, show them. Là, on est à la Kabukicho Place. Voilà, euh, franchement, je kiffe ma vie ici. Ça fait trois, deux mois que je suis là. Je reste encore deux mois et euh, je kiffe ma vie. Et le mec qui vient de poster cette vidéo est incroyable. C'est un professeur, professeur, right? Oh, incroyable, je suis incroyable. incroyable. Exactly. Yeah, you got it. Vous êtes mes nouveaux et amis. Streamer Winter Zuko, streamer Winter Zuko, très important, streamer Winter Zuko. Voilà. Merci. Voilà. Merci. Merci. So I was out wandering the streets of Shinjuku at night, grateful that I'd finished all of my teaching responsibilities and keen for a night off without students, only to end up getting accosted by a bunch of students and engaging in debates about the complexities of East Asian geopolitics. Whatever you do, do not say that. I mean, China is in, uh, Look at Taiwan is independent, so right? What? Taiwan is independent. Yeah. Yeah. You don't Chinese! <laughs> so, shout out to my nouveaux amis, Watashi no Atareshi, Tomodachi, and feel free to check out their instance. Now, before we start talking about the subtleties of this lens, let's talk first about the one thing that probably had the most influence on the photos, and that was the film. 
being tungsten balanced and developed in the normal C41 color negative process rather than the ECN2 it was designed for, the 800T film doesn't really have an objective reference to help with white balance or color grading. But I guess that's part of the fun of it, isn't it? Shooting at night in unnatural light meant I wasn't trying to get perfect skin tones of my subjects, really just going for whatever looks nice at the time. That said, I scanned all of the negatives as raw images with all of the same settings which gave me the chance to feast at the smorgasbord of post-processing that is Lightroom. Let me know if you'd like me to cover my approach to film scanning and no, unlike the majority of film photography YouTubers out there, Negative Lab Pro never gave me a free copy to review. I do mine manually. Why? Well, because first of all, I am a photographic artisan, preserving age-old techniques of film photography colour grading to pass down to my grandchildren, and look, okay, I'll fess up, I'm just too cheap. But I digress. With these pictures, I applied a basic inversion and white balance to all of them to give a consistent flat image, and then outputted them as positive TIFFs to do final tweaks on them later, going from images like this to images like that. I really do like 800T for night photography. I realize that's probably not a revelation to most people. Neon lights at night make great fodder for those red hot halations. All I did was remove the black Promis filter and replace the classic Cinestill petrol station for the urban frenzy of Shinjuku. And of course, I shot by hand, which meant, well, for a bit of a mixed bag as you've seen. But I'm not sure if it's a combination of the tungsten balance with traditional negative processing, but the images do have a somewhat muted and arguably cinematic look, which now I mention it probably sounds a bit obvious given its motion picture film stock. As for the lens, it's got seven elements, seven optical elements in six groups, and that makes quite a simple spherical design. That does make this quite a traditional lens in many respects. Coming in at 360 grams, it's a solid piece of metal and glass, just a bit of rubber and plastic to give it a comfortable feel under your fingertips. I don't get the sense that this lens will just fall apart on me. The lens actually has a long history. It's been in production for over 40 years, and in all of my research, while I can't find anywhere you can buy this new, I can't find any evidence that it's actually been cancelled. As of 21, 22 at least, the lens was quite widely available. Now, with the deprecation of the F-mount for the Z and Nikon slowly bringing down the guillotine on its DSLR range, you're probably going to have to hit the second-hand market if you want to get one yourself. Is it cheap? No, but I managed to pick this particular one up from a second-hand shop, a tiny little camera shop in Seoul, South Korea, for about 350 Australian dollars when the borders reopened. Hunting down old camera tech is kind of a hobby when I visit a new country, or perhaps better described as an unhealthy compulsion. Certainly unhealthy on the wallet, but hey, it beats coming home with commemorative tea towels or souvenir fridge magnets. I won't even mention what I bought while I actually was in Japan. Let's save that for a future video. As for the image quality, well, it's difficult to judge based on night shots like these. One thing is clear is when it's sharp, it's sharp. And when it's not sharp, it's, hmm. Well, look, I blame the challenges of shooting in the dark and focusing an f1.2 lens with a focus field thinner than the collected poetry of Keanu Reeves. One thing that this lens screams out for is to be shot in black and white. So the next day I was leaving Japan, but I still had half a roll of black and white film, Ilford HP5 pushed to 1600. Time to see how this thing renders monochrome. <laughs>
some salt and pepper grain to season these slabs of photo vericissitude. And yes, I'm aware that that's not actually a word. Look, this is not an unknown lens. There are lots of good reviews out there and I don't know how many people are going to bother to tune into this video unless you're a total Japanophile and so Shinichi that you're actually going to bother to watch some random Australian guy snapping shots around Tokyo. But hey, you're here, and while you're here, you may as well subscribe so you can be notified of more unscientific ruminations about whatever takes my photographic fancy. As for this lens, it's definitely worth boning up if a middle-aged white man is allowed to say that phrase because it does take a bit of knowledge to get the most out of it. It's not Nikon's only standard f1.2 lens, the other two being a 55mm f1.2 that preceded this one, and the knocked Nikkor 50 mm f1.2, which had better spherical correction, but they stopped making that in 1997 and cost quite a bit more anyway. This one has stood the test of time. So why? Well, despite the love shown for it online, it's not a perfect lens. I went out to dinner on the weekend and I shot a few pictures at f1.2 on my digital camera to experiment while quelling the sense of dread as my daughter drove my precious Mini, all the time commenting casually about how much fun it is when you really get to put your foot down. You'll see that it's not a particularly sharp lens. Or is it? There is just something about the way that this lens renders things wide open. It's almost like you're shooting with two lenses in one. The first provides crispness to that thin plane of focus, particularly at the center of the frame, while the second just gives everything an ethereal wash. So it's both sharp and soft at the same time, and quite unique. Not sure if that makes sense, but you get the idea. Think of it almost like an inbuilt Orton effect, where you overlay a blurred version of your image and play around with the blend mode and opacity to get something both hard and soft at the same time like cheese, to go with the cheesy photos and the even more cheesy YouTube narration. So f1.2 is unique. Stop down to f2 and all of that blur goes away and you end up with a lens that is bitingly sharp throughout the frame. As evidence, I present the rear of the restaurant at f2. Note the sharpness of the sign, almost as friendly and charming as my daughter's knuckle tattoos. Find yourself some light and stop down further to f8 and it really doesn't get any better after this. To try and add a bit of objectivity to the process, I took a picture of one of the bookcases in our family room, all on my Nikon Z6 with the F to Z adapter on a tripod with the ISO set to 100. I focused on the spine of the Holiday Stories for Girls book. As we scroll through the images from f1.2 all the way down to 16, probably the most obvious thing that strikes you is the vignetting wide open. Like the dark corners of my own mind, the edges of the image are plunged into a nihilistic shadow. And it's not even edges really, more a big hot spot in the middle. To the extent that at f1.2, it actually has an impact on the perceived brightness of the image. Stop it down to f2 and already it's a lot better. By f4, it's barely noticeable and pretty much gone at f5.6. Obviously, you're not going to notice it to this extent unless you're particularly fond of taking photos of blank walls, but hey, as much as I applaud your minimalist aesthetic, if that's your thing, then this probably isn't the lens for you. In the real world, the vignetting actually tends to add rather than subtract to a lot of the images, but it's good to know that if you want consistency across the frame, stop it down to f5.6 and you're good to go. As for sharpness, well, it's already usable at f1.2. The word usable, of course, is subjective, but at the center, it's really quite sharp. The edges are a lot mushier though. Lots of modern lenses will beat this, but hey, it took Nikon 40 years to release a standard f1.2 prime for the Z mount, and it's huge, and it costs six times the price of this. So I'll make do with this performance. Yes, you are stuck with that late 70s Bo Derek movie soft porn haze, but at least your camera equipment is free of Vaseline or other smeary exudates as you render that dreamy glow. Look, 
If it's not to your taste, then perhaps this isn't the lens for you, or at least not the aperture for you. There are two unlabeled intermediate click stops before you hit f2, probably f1.4 and f1.8. The center does get a bit sharper and contrasty, but the corners don't really do much at all until you hit around f2, and then, wow, what a difference. The edges brighten up and sharpen up and the center just gets crisper. You can really see the sharpness on the text and on the texture of the book cover. F4 and F5.6 ring a bit more detail out of the lens, particularly in the corners, but after that it just stays pretty consistent until some very mild diffraction kicks in at F16. So pretty good performance overall. But of course, if I'm going to extol the virtues of this lens, then I have to find some benchmark by which to judge it. So let's find a point of comparison. I swapped out the f1.2 for another 50, and no, not a native Z lens. Gotta make this a fair fight. The lens is older and only goes up to f1.4, so let's compare them at that aperture. At first glance, not so different. Both produce quite pleasing images at f1.4. Look at the center at 100% though, and one flaw becomes obvious. The 50mm f1.2 does exhibit a moderate amount of chromatic aberration. And it's not the good kind of chromatic aberration that's easy to fix either. The lens produces both green and purple fringing at either edge of the focal plane. This longitudinal chromatic aberration is a pain. And while it's not severe, it is noticeable. So go easy on rendering those specular highlights on your platinum plated Leica M6. I think it's fair to say that you won't notice it a lot of the time. It really didn't show itself among the noise and color of the night shots. And of course, black and white film is going to hide all of that stuff anyway, but it's definitely there and the cruel reality of digital shows all the flaws. Our candidate lens definitely is competitive in the center, perhaps even slightly beating the f1.2, but it's a different story in the corners where the image just becomes a jittery mess in comparison to the slightly fuzzy but quite dignified corners of the Nikon 50mm f1.2. As you stop down, again, typically things sharpen up. The differences between the two lenses diminish and you end up with a much more level playing field. And which lens is the mystery contender? It's this, my Nikon 5cm f1.4, built for the Leica thread mount used on rangefinders from the 1950s, and a lens that pretty much lives permanently on my Canon P. Check out the above link for a deep dive into that particular optic. Ultimately though, neither of these lenses are going to beat a modern design for sharpness. A lot of the flaws of this 50mm f1.2 come from the simple spherical optical design. It doesn't seem like they did much to tinker with it either to try and correct the issues. There's no fancy ED glass here, so you can't rely on the focus plane being completely flat. In my example, I didn't try to ensure every item on the shelf was actually at the same focus point. I'm not that OCD and more importantly, it does allow you then to see how the focus falls off at the wide apertures. What it's probably mitigating is that where the corners are in focus, it might not be the exact same distance from the central point, if that makes sense. Honestly, I've never noticed it in real life. One characteristic that you may notice though, is that lenses like this don't perform the same at different distances. This is actually quite a close focusing lens, allowing you to get up to half a meter away from your subject, allowing for a reproduction ratio of one to 7.9. Okay, not macro, but also not bad for 50 millimeters. The result is not too pretty though. There's no floating element here, obviously, and a lot of the criticism I've seen of the wide open performance of this lens has been based on the close-up shots I've seen of shiny objects, which is probably the worst case scenario. At normal distances, the softness at f1.2 adds just a touch of an ethereal glow. To me, it only seems when you really close up that you really lose a lot of that contrast and detail. Finally, and perhaps the most noticeable result of this simple design is that this thing distorts like crazy. Now, in some scenarios, this can be a deal breaker. If you're an architectural film photographer that prints in the darkroom, you need your straight lines. This thing bows like, well, a bow, I guess, giving it a distinctly noticeable barrel distortion.
If you look at this image, it's definitely distracting. Fortunately, it's quite regular and easily fixed in Lightroom, and I don't print in the darkroom, so really not a major concern. If your goal is darkroom printing, though, you might want to avoid this lens. But you're not buying this lens for optical perfection. It has character. You take a mundane scene like this, and f1.2 renders it with a delicacy and almost a beauty. It's not sharp, but it's sharp enough. More importantly, it's got beautiful background separation. And let's be real, these lenses are less about what's in focus and more about what's actually out of focus. Again, newer lenses might beat this one in terms of pure blur and roundness of the bokeh balls, but if you're looking for a lens with character and fun, Something that will play with blur without throwing a mess of it in your face like a cold bowl of last night's spaghetti, then this is your man or woman. Or hey, let's not ascribe gender specific terms to something so unique. It is its own self, squinty and feline in the corners at f1.2, getting blobby and already starting to reveal some of the edges of those nine aperture blades at f2. You can see how the effect changes as you stop the lens down here, going from bubbles to nonagons to pinpoints as the aperture narrows, and yes, you do get sun stars too. I'm sure nobody was testing this lens with an iPhone LED torch when they first designed it, but in this case you can see how the lens manages to show off those stars without getting too flary as those photons bounce around between the elements. Again, good performance, perhaps due to the simple design. Which brings us to micro contrast, 3D pop, or whatever you want to call that disputed characteristic that everybody attributes to Zeiss lenses, but in reality is just an acknowledgement that lenses with fewer elements let in more light more cleanly while reducing internal reflections. Well, whatever that pixie dust is, and that topic is probably worth a video on its own, I do think that this lens has it. In the end, it's capable of distinct, beautiful images and more importantly, it performs differently depending on how you use it. So in your capable hands, it could be the Swiss Army knife of lenses. In my less capable hands, it's probably more of a spoon fashioned from the lid of a jam jar and tied to a piece of dowel with string. But if I can make images that I find interesting with it, then I'm sure that you can too. Nikon started making these around 1978, and there have been hundreds of thousands of these roll off the production line since then. You may even have one yourself, and if you do, please let us know in the comments below. Do you think a lens like this still holds up in the 2020s, or is it time to put this baby to bed? Am I taking imperfections here and calling them character? After all, they've now brought out two standard f1.2 lenses for the Nikon Z line in the last couple of years. Maybe I should just sell this one on eBay for a profit and treat myself to an upgrade. Surely I deserve that Nikon 58mm knocked f1.2 Z for just 12,000 Australian dollars. Okay, I'll make do with this later.